joy as I consider your faith and your love for the brethren. Um, though we've only known each other for a little while, I really feel as though my heart has been knit together with yours in love. Um, and I see you all for what you truly are as my beloved brethren. So I thank you for that. Um, and God has used you all in a mighty way to draw me closer to him. Um, Jesus says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And my purpose in standing before you today is that my words will reveal the new heart that the Lord has placed within me. Considering so great a salvation we have, it's difficult to limit his accomplishments to my life in just 15 minutes. Um, so what I want to focus on this morning is the truth that God, that Jesus has consecrated a new and living way and how I have experienced that in my own life. And it's fitting that my heart was drawn to this text being that that's what Pat preached on. It was just coincident or maybe God's providence <laughs> that we both um, focused on that as we were considering what the Lord has accomplished on our behalf. Um, and I want to start off by taking you back to my old man and my old way of life, which is really not life at all. Um, as is the condition of everyone outside of Christ, I was living according to the lust of the flesh, entangled in sin, lost, in darkness, without God and without hope. I was preoccupied with the things of this world. I was blind and storing up wrath for myself, and in one word, dead. Proverbs 14:12 reads, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And that was my attitude. Um, the way that I was living, was living was pretty good in my own eyes. At least the good things I did outnumbered the bad. And uh, I believe that God would forgive me for the little sins, the few ones that I had. Um, and these were the lies that filled my heart and filled my way, um, the way that was leading me to death. I did not know that the way I was living was leading to death, and I needed someone to show me the way of life. Um, though I had every earthly advantage a teenager could ask for, a great family, a great boyfriend that would end up being my husband one day. Uh, <laughs> um, popularity and success in school and athletics that would lead to a college scholarship. Um, these passing pleasures did not satisfy a thirst that I had within me. Um, I felt incomplete and without purpose. And like the woman at the well, I needed living water. I just didn't know it yet. I grew up in a home where Jesus was never mentioned, although I had great parents um, that brought me up to try to do, uh, treat others the way that I would like to be treated. Um, I looked at creation that surrounded me and I, I started to believe that there was a God, God must exist, and I knew that there were things in my life that disgusted him. But I had no idea how to make things right between God and I, and something that you'll find out about me is that I always like to have a plan. I like to be in control and I like to fix things. And what I realized is that I had no idea how to get to God. I had very little control against the lusts of my flesh and there was no way that I could erase my offenses toward God. My spirit was unsettled within me and I had a yearning and a desire to know more about the Lord and praise the Almighty that those that diligently seek him will find him. And that as you draw near to him, he also draws near to you. And according to God's perfect timing, he brought someone into my life to share the gospel with me as I was earnestly searching for him. And it was September 2000. Um, I was 17, and I was invited to a Bible study. And this was the first time that I ever really read the Bible, the first time I ever understood anything that I was hearing about God. And it was as if a veil had been removed from my eyes. And now I understood my current condition and its remedy. I was far off from God at that time, storing up wrath for myself, but God in his great mercy had provided a way out of that, from that condemnation of sin. Um, one of the most arresting thoughts for me when I first heard the gospel preached was that I could be forgiven for all of my sin, and not only that, but God would remember them no more. Um, Jesus took away the sin of the world and brought in everlasting righteousness, and I was awestruck with the extent that God went to to reconcile the world to himself. Um, prior to hearing the gospel, I had no understanding of the suffering and sacrifice of Christ. I mean, Jesus left his glory in heaven. He humbled himself to take on the form of a man. He lived a life of sorrows. He died that I might live. He was bruised for my iniquities. He was marred beyond that of any man. He was made to be sin 
He was delivered over to the hands of godless men, and he was forsaken by God. Um, but what I didn't fully comprehend at that time was exactly what he accomplished in those sufferings. Um, this is what this meeting is all about, what he accomplished. And what I began to understand over the most recent two years is that he completed the work that he was given to do. He conquered death and set captives free. He took away the sin of the entire world. He ended the law as a means of righteousness. He made peace through his blood. He delivered us from this present evil world. He provided access to grace. He destroyed the devil, and he provided a living hope. Um, living under the law uh, was an emphasis on myself. I'm kind of fast-forwarding here. Um, let me see. Only Christ could accomplish these things that we're talking about. And the first time hearing these things, I fell in the one that is truly lovely. Prior to hearing these things, I didn't think there was a way to the Father. He was too far off, and I was too far lost. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is the way to the Father. There is no other way to the Father but by him. And the way that I was living was leading to death, but the way of Jesus led to everlasting life. Understanding the labor of God in Christ to make a way to him and realizing his kindness created in me a godly sorrow that led to repentance. And I determined to no longer live for myself, but for him who died and gave himself up for me. On January 2, 2001, my old self and old manner of life was done away with, and I was raised to walk in a newness of life. And at that time, I received understanding that Jesus is the way to the Father, but it has been in the past two years that I've come to really understand that that way is a living way. It is a living way because Jesus is the living one. It's a living way because Jesus made the way not only through his death, but by his life. But one of my favorite things about the new and living way is that it, it's a way that produces life and life more abundant in the believer. Um, after my new birth, I quickly fell into the trap of living under a system of law. The very means of attaining righteousness before God that I never accomplished when I was outside of Christ was what I reverted back to. Only I wasn't trying to live according to old covenant laws. I was living according to a new set of laws. Um, my purpose, or the only reason I read the Bible, was reading it to see what I was to do. Uh, my sole focus for existing was to save the lost. And while these are things that you must do, um, it was an improper emphasis. It was an emphasis on myself. Um, as the hymn writer states, when we turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face, the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Focusing our attention on Jesus results in great change and growth in us. Communion with Christ, learning from him, is where we find nourishment for our spirit. And on the contrary, when we focus our attention on ourselves and our own abilities, we become distracted, distraught, and unfruitful. Living under the law, my emphasis was on myself. I exalted in my own abilities and really said nothing of God's working. Or maybe I didn't believe that God was busy still working. I was tricked into believing that Christ accomplished what he needed to on the cross, and now it was up to me to do my part. Um, but praise the one true God that he is still working. Just consider some of the things that Christ is doing now. He's, he's shepherding me, interceding on my behalf, mediating, mediating a new covenant, purifying me, leading me, nourishing me, aiding me, and preparing a place for me. Um, this way of living under the law was killing me. Um, I started to view reading the word and assembling as duties. Um, I was burdened with lists of obligations. It was robbing me of my joy. I started seeing saving lost souls as my responsibility. And I was frequently depressed when someone rejected the word. Um, and as I looked at family members that ridiculed me, um, I was depressed by that. Um, I didn't recognize that God drew people to himself. Uh, living under the law caused me to be riddled with guilt because I was never empowered to accomplish all that God commanded. Um, I was never able to overcome sin in this state. I, I continued to give in to the same temptations, and I didn't know that God could help me overcome these things. Living out, under the law, I was living at, at a distance from God. This was because of that sin that kept creeping into my life that was causing the separation between God and I um, and this guilt that caused me to hide from God at times. 
Um, I was on a spiritual roller coaster without any real consistency. I was without peace and generally restricted as to what I could receive from the Lord. Living under the law, um, I had placed God in this neat little box. And I had already determined everything that I believed out him, about him. So when I was reading scripture, anything that contradicted things I already believed, I couldn't receive and accept. That's what living under the law <laughs> did for me. Um, it's impossible for God to teach you anything. He will not teach you anything when you live in this way. Um, but praise God that he rescued me from that way and helped me to see the new and living way. I would describe this new and living way to the Father as one that is full of grace. Um, again, it was through the preaching of the Gospels that, Gospel that my eyes were opened to this truth I can testify that the preaching of the gospel is enough to change a person. In fact, I believe it is the only way that a person can be changed because faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. Um, the preaching of Brother Given and the faithful brethren here transformed my husband. I saw the struggle that he went through. As he wrestled with doctrines that we had been taught and what scripture really said, and I witnessed the Lord humbling him and giving him understanding until the knowledge of God's will. And as a result to all these transformations, his preaching changed, and so did the messages that I heard. The power of God is seen in the message proclaimed, and after coming to face to face with his power and hearing the truth, I was challenged in my thinking and my heart was softened to really hear the gospel. And I want to share with you two main things, two important and foundational things that stood out to me over the course of the past two years. Um, I realized that I didn't really understand the extent of God's salvation. I don't know that I'll ever fully comprehend, but I had a very, very small view. Um, I now understand that salvation is not primarily for my benefit, but primarily for God's glory. I used to think that if I was the only person on the earth, that Jesus still would have died just for me. Uh, but God's salvation was in motion before the foundation of the world. God's salvation is a lot bigger than I previously thought. Salvation shows God as just and the justifier, and he is glorified in his work because he is the only one that could reconcile the world to himself. Not only has God taken away the sin of the world, but he has provided a solution of the corrupted nature. He has taken away guilt and made the believer complete. He has placed a piece of himself inside the believer to will and to work for his good pleasure. The letter, the letter to the Ephesians remains as one of my favorite pieces of scripture. It is a good reminder to me of what Christ has accomplished on my behalf. And it reads, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And I love that Christ has brought me near. There is no better place to be. And my husband always says that, in order to get all the gooey good stuff that God has to offer, you have to get in close. The scripture continues, for Christ himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. Prior to Christ's sacrifice and my being united with him, God's wrath was abiding on me. But now I realize that living according to God's grace, it really does produce life. Those that are Born again aren't described as, described as should, but are living in a certain way. 
the new and living way under grace results in faith. God increases my faith as I see him more clearly because I become more convinced that he is completely able to do all that he has promised. Amen. Living under grace now results in great joy within me because I know that my present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to me. Living under grace, I have hope as the anchor of my soul. Living under grace, I have freedom from the slavery to sin. Um, Christ has set me free, and I am free indeed. And my new man is created in power and righteousness. I, I have a part of me that cannot even be tempted. Um, as long as I'm nourishing that new man, I have a great um, weapon against Satan and his fiery darts. Living under grace, I can experience nearness to God. Grace has taken away the enmity, enmity and brought me near to, th to his throne of grace. Living under grace, I have a clear conscience before the Lord. Christ has cleansed my conscience by the washing of regeneration. Living under grace, there's a transformation within me by the renewing of my mind in Christ. Living under grace, my heart now desires to please God with the new heart that he's put it within me, and I'm able to do so because he helps me. Um, God has placed um, a new heart within me and written his laws upon my heart. Living under grace, I have a spirit that's characterized by power and might. Um, now under grace, I have peace that surpasses understanding, and I have a great capacity to receive the things from the Lord. Um, I feel as though my heart has been enlarged, and I have more room for him to work within me. Um, and now, my emphasis is not on what I must do, what man must do, but what on, God, on what God does. I rejoice that God gives help to accomplish the things that he requires, and that he offers grace to help in our time of need. It is a good thought to know that we serve a God who can do far more abundantly beyond all that we can think or imagine, and that he gives us everything needed for life and godliness. It's good to know that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's good to know that there's no good thing that God withholds from those that walk uprightly. It's good to know that no matter what the circumstance is, that God's grace is sufficient. It's also good to know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, and that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. To make it safely through the wilderness of this world will require, require a lot of grace. But praise God that he will multiply grace in us through the knowledge of Christ. And these are now the thoughts that occupy my mind and fill my heart. Amen. I stand before you as a new creation. I am not who I used to be because Christ has consecrated a new and living way to the Father. Jesus is now my way, my life, and my truth. <laughs>